we said, everybody, thank you very much for joining us. This is a webinar focusing on acquired heart conditions, um, specifically Kawasaki's disease and myocarditis. And we're focusing predominantly on the acute paediatric setting. We have a packed agenda this afternoon, so thank you all for joining us. Um, our speakers are from a wide range of disciplines. So David Ho, who's one of the Paediatric Immunology and Infectious Diseases Consultants at the Evelina. Nadia Rafiq, who works in the Rheumatology Department in the Evelina. Alessandra Masola, who is featuring in both sections as a Cardiology Consultant. And then from the Evelina PICU and Retrieval Service, we have um, Shelley Rapagan and Manal Alasnag. And then Sandra Gala Peralta is speaking from the Royal Brompton. Alina Botgross is one of our virology consultants. And Rachel Panico will be talking about novel treatments for um, myocarditis. And she also works in the Paediatric Immunology and Infectious Diseases Departments here at the Evelina. Um, so our next speaker is um, talking on the topic now. So we're changing from Kawasaki's disease to focusing on the enteroviruses. Um, and Alina Botgross, who's one of the virologists at um, Evelina and St. Thomas's, is going to give us an overview of the enterovirus associated diseases. And I can see that you've got the slides up there perfectly, Alina, so we'll hand over to you. Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk. So, um, yeah, I was asked to give you a, a basic overview of enteroviruses and associated diseases. And why is that? Because at the beginning of uh, April and uh, May, um, UKHSA sent an alert that a cluster of uh, severe neonatal myocarditis was reported in Wales in southwest England. So, and this was uh, this was sent also to WHO to um, let them know. So, a total of ten severe neonatal uh, myocarditis cases aged on the 20 days days between June uh, last year and April this year were found in South Wales. Um, uh, neonates were presented very unwell on uh, PICU with cardiogenic show required ventilatory and circulatory support. Uh, in all these uh, severe um, uh, neonatal myocarditis uh, was confirmed enterovirus infection and um, uh, the five uh, strains that were typed were identified by Coxsackie virus uh, um, B3 or B4. Then retrospective cases finding identified only two other cases on neonatal myocarditis in the previous six years prior to June 2022 in the same region. So definitely increase in uh, the severe uh, neonatal myocarditis. A further um, five uh, cases have been identified over the same period in the southwest of England of the four strains that were typed, all were identified by Coxsackie B3. Uh, in terms of enteroviruses, so um, as I said uh, briefly, I don't want to uh, um, tell too, too much, to go too much into that. So the uh, enterovir genus enterovirus, um, they are um, part of the big family of picornavirite, which includes polio virus, coxsackie virus, echoviruses, and other numbered enteroviruses and rhinoviruses. And you can have some um, images um, here when uh, enterovirus, um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, are divided in four species designed uh, at uh, A through D. Um, human rhinoviruses are also divided in through species A, B, and C. And um, you know, since recently, number of known enteroviruses type is more than 100. And other different papers they say there are more than 200. So definitely, a lot of enterovirus subtypes. In terms of other um, Similar viruses with enterovirus are parechovirus that initially was included as enteroviruses and they are quite similar but differ sufficiently in genomic sequence to be classified a separate genus. Um, 
Um, in terms of uh, virology of enteroviruses, they are very small uh, virus, approximately 29 nanometers, non-enveloped variants, consist of, of an icosahedral capsid composed of 60 subunits, um, and each are formed uh, for proteins for VP1 to VP4, um, and they enclose a single positive stranded RNA genome of about 7.5 kb. They are uh, relatively acid resistant, maintaining infectivity over a wide pH range, and they are resistant to other uh, ether and alcohol, but inactivated at temperature above uh, 50 degrees UV light, chlorination, and formaldehyde. Uh, in terms of uh, replication, so you have um, image here of uh, um, replication of the enteroviruses, so the virus binds to the cell, uh, cell receptor and the uh, genome is uncoated, then the viral protein is removed and the viral RNA is translated. Uh, the viral RNA polymerase is copied and produces a negative sense RNA uh, strand. Uh, after that, um, after the, uh, it, it, this is copied, it produces more positive sense RNA strand, and later in infection, um, the positive sense RNA strand enter the morphogenetic pathway, um, and after that, cell lysis occurs releasing newly synthesized virus uh, particles. In terms of uh, enterovirus pathogenesis, um, this is quite similar in all people now. So initially, the initial site of, um, of your virus replication include both oropharynx and um, terminal ileum. Uh, replication give um, rise in transient minor uh, vi uh, viremia, which spread virus then uh, through blood to lymphoid tissue throughout um, the body. And uh, subsequent replication of these sites produce a major vi uh, secondary viremia. Um, which coincide with the onset of symptoms and um, results in spread of the virus to uh, targeted organs such as, um, you can see here, skin, muscle, brain, meninges, liver. In terms of epidemiology, so enteroviruses are distributed worldwide and infection occurs throughout the year where temperate climates experience high rates of infection in summer and autumn. Uh, although Enteroviruses occur, infections occur in all age groups. Infants less than one year of age um, became infected, or rather, that exceed those of older children and adults by several fold. Usually, they are uh, self limited um, infections and do not usually cause symptomatic infection of the gastrointestinal uh, system, although they are uh, called enteroviruses. In terms of main um, system that are affected by enterovirus, central nervous system infections, um, viral aseptic meningitis occur in all ages, um, but in more commonly observed in infants under one year of age. Uh, group B coxsackie viruses and equiviruses are more common clinical manifestation in, uh, in um, infants are fever and irritability. In older children and adults, they present with fever, headache, net, uh, stiff uh, neck, nausea and vomiting, so as a normal uh, meningitis. And in terms of encephalitis, this can complicate the septic meningitis in uh, 5 to 10 percent of patients. Another important manifestation is acute flaccid myelitis and brainstem encephalitis. Um, acute motor neuron weakness is known as acute flaccid paralysis or acute flaccid myelitis. Um, and this was reported with many enterovirus serotypes, uh, first reported in 2012, and since then increased in reported cases in 2014, 16, 18, with a uh, big outbreak reported in the United States since 2014, about 500 cases have been reported. And similar cases were reported in Europe, Canada, and Japan. Uh, only a small number associated with endemic and epidemic paralysis, uh, paracovirus type 1, 2, and 3, enterovirus D68 and 8, um, A71. These viruses target motor neutrons, uh, neurons in the brainstem and spinal cord. Um, enterovirus A A71 was associated with severe form of brainstem encephalitis in young children.
And just very quickly to tell you about enterovirus A71 and D68. So enterovirus A71 was identified first in California in 69 um, and has evolved as a unique cause of epidemic paralysis. Um, large outbreaks were um, mostly uh, observing children, young children uh, younger than six years of age, uh, reported in US, uh, Eastern Europe, Russia and some um, um, Asian countries and uh, smaller outbreaks in the United States. Um, infants and uh, young uh, children are at risk of uh, brainstem encephalitis associated with high mortality related rapid uh, cardiovascular collapse, pulmonary edema and rapidly fatal course. Um, there are a vaccine uh, that uh, apparently protect against enterovirus AC71 um, that is um, used in China. Enterovirus D68 was discovered in 62, uh, has been associated with sporadic cases of respiratory disease and minor outbreaks worldwide. Um, in 2014, the United States declared a national outbreak and reported cases worldwide with uh, over 2,000 cases. Um, and in these uh, outbreaks, uh, acute uh, flaccid myelitis uh, increases in incidence as well. In 2016, in the uh, UK, a cluster of neurological illness was associated with enterovirus D68, uh, reported in South Wales. Um, um, cases reported with acute focal limb weakness and or cranial nerve dysfunction with a mild to moderate lymphocytic pleocytosis in CSF and non-enhancing gray matter spinal cord lesions and MRI. Um, for you to know, you, um, the enterovirus D68 is rarely um, isolated from CSF, mainly identified in nasopharyngeal um, specimen. Other um, symptoms and syndromes um, associated with enteroviruses, exantens, these morbiliform rashes, um, you can see in this image, fine erythematose, macular papular rash, common in summer months, um, uh, this is associated usually with Echovirus 9 um, and a rash appears um, uh, simultaneously with fever and starts on face. Roseoliform rashes, it's um, di uh, discrete, non pruritic, salmon pink macular papular rash in face and upper chest, prodromic fever and pharyngitis. Um, it's contagious, especially among young children, and Echovirus 16 was most uh, commonly associated. Hand, foot, and mouth disease, everyone is aware about this disease. Distinct in vesicular eruption, uh, usually caused by Coxsackie um, A16 and Enterovirus A71, most common in children under age 10. Um, manifestation of fever, vesicles on mouth and on the hands and feet. Sometimes could look like chickenpox, but uh, illness is generally milder. Uh, generalized vesicular eruptions, um, most frequently as, uh, caused by Coxsackie virus A9 and Echovirus 11. Um, lesions are similar with hand foot mouth disease, but uh, occurring crops on the hand trunk extremities, and also sometimes um, can be confused with chickenpox. Respiratory disease, upper respiratory infections, um, with uh, manifested with fevers, with sore throat, cough and coryza, uh, cause majority of summer colds in children, coxic virus 20, A21 and 24, and echovirus 11, mostly cause of these um, res upper respiratory infections. Epidemic pleurodynia, it's an acute disease with fever and um, pain on the chest and upper abdomen muscles. Uh, fever peaks one of, uh, after onset of pain, lasts between four and six days usually, but can persist for months. Um, in terms of myocarditis, um, it's um, inflammation of uh, myocardium and uh, particularly uh, group B Coxsackie viruses um, are involved in um, uh, my uh, myocarditis. Um, virus appears to replicate in myofibrils, leading to um, necrosis and focal inflammation. You can have a histopathology image of um, enterovirus infection in human heart, uh, human heart disease. Um, in terms of uh, enterovirus infection in neonates, uh, particularly neonates are susceptible to severe enterovirus infections, um, and uh, most serious infections are 
occur perinatally and probably are acquired from the mother, but also can occur from a um, ma family member of the family, can be self-limited, but uh, can also evolve uh, with uh, life-threatening um, complications. As I told you, Group B Coxsackie virus serotype 2 to 5 and Echovirus 11 are frequently associated um, with a severe systemic neonatal infections, uh, usually it's biphasic illness, initially with mild non-specific symptoms between three and seven days of life, followed by um, a period between one and seven days when the uh, baby is well. After that, uh, generalized disease follow with myocarditis or other complications like encephalitis, and as I say, group B coxsackie virus is involved, and fulminant hepatitis, um, uh, manifestation with uh, hypotensor bleeding, multiple organ failure, usually echovirus 11 is involved. Um, usually the outcome is influenced by presence or absence of passively acquired maternal neutralizing antibodies. Uh, if you're interested to read this systematic review in uh, clinical characteristic of severe neonatal enterovirus uh, infection done by a um, uh, Chinese team, and they sh they uh, reviewed PubMed and based on web of science um, or search, and in total, 16 article with 237 cases of severe neonatal enterovirus infection were included, um, and all neonates developed severe complication. Um, the most frequent severe complication was uh, hepatitis uh, or coagulopathy. 37% had myocarditis, 11% meningoencephalitis, and about 66% have um, HLH. Uh, the uh, lethality uh, rate of neonates with severe infection was about 30%. Um, and the highest mortality was uh, observing neonates with myocarditis. Coxsackie virus B again was seen in a more than 50% of neonates. Um, in terms of what um, should we diagnose in terms of laboratory diagnosis, the real time PCR are typically used for enterovirus detection. They are very sensitive, very rapid, and widely available on all laboratory uh, in uh, hospitals. Um, but they are not identified as serotypes. So, in terms of what samples should be tested uh, for detection of enterovirus, this include um, EGTA blood and upper respiratory tract samples, which could be also nasopharyngeal swabs or nasopharyngeal aspirates, stool sample, and if clinically indicated, a CSF. Uh, positive real-time PCR tests from stool are supportive, but less definitive as many present long carriage from a previous infection. Um, to, just to mention, the serology, not to use it. So there are some labs that are still doing serology for enteroviruses, but the clinical utility is limited due to the cross reactivity of the antigen used between the different serotypes. The two week interval between acute and covalent samples make diagnosis low and offer clinical irrelevance. So we don't recommend to test for um, um, enterovirus uh, uh, serology. In some circumstances, when myocarditis, biocarditis, or cardiomyopathy is suspected and direct sampling impossible, antibody detection can be useful for diagnosis, but um, very rarely. In terms of enterovirus uh, typing, sequencing is part, uh, part of the VPN1 capsic protein is the gold standard for enterovirus typing. But uh, obviously, in cases of new recombinant form enterovirus, if, if suspected, then sequencing additional parts of the genome or ob obtaining a full genome uh, should be advised. Um, in terms of reporting enterovirus infections, so in UK, so um, enterovirus infections are not notifiable diseases, um, but all, probably you are aware, all positive enterovirus samples from NHS labs should be referred to enteric virus unix. So automatically, all positive samples are um, sent to them. Um, neonatal myocarditis cases diagnosis uh, 1st of June last year should be reported by the clinical team to UK HSA by uh, emailing them, and there is a form. Uh, 
that should be completed well with all clinical details and um, um, so in, in this sense should be notified. And uh, just to be aware, so this increase of, you know, severe neonatal infection with um, enterovirus was observed in other countries as well in Europe and uh, WHO was notified by France at the beginning of um, April and May about severe um, neonatal infections linked with a new variant of um, enterovirus named Echovirus 11. And uh, you can see here from 443 enterovirus neonatal infections, um, seven deaths occur, so our case fatality rate 1.6%, much higher than previously seen. Um, and Echovirus 11 was the predominant circulating enterovirus type. 4.5% um, were classified as severe. Um, um, and the most um, common manifestation in their cohort was uh, liver failure, so sepsis-like uh, syndrome and with liver failure. Um, compared with our cases in UK that, as I said, coxic virus B3 and B4, they're more um, involved and uh, the manifestation were with a severe myocarditis. Thank you. So over to you, Manel. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marilyn and, and Elena, for uh, giving me a head start. Um, the slide seems to be. Sorry, I'm a bit stuck here. Uh, is that your mouse not working? Yeah, let me see if this works. Okay, there we are. Um, so I'll talk about how we all get together to to work when we suspect a, a, a case. Um, the first encounter of the patient is obviously at the DGH, where the team um, uh, diagnose, uh, stabilize, uh, and manage. The retrieval service becomes part of that team as soon as we get the call. Um, we um, we act initially as a second pair of eyes, basically um, from a distance, going through the presentation, especially when the case is no is not so straightforward. We advise our management. We discuss the differential, um, and if. if in the scenario of, of an acutely decompensating um, critically uh, ill child, we'll talk about further stabilization. And then we'll leave um, the DGH team to focus on the child while we secure a PQ bed that's, that has the subspecialties that are needed to, um, to help uh, facilitate um, more advanced treatment. And we're going to dispatch a um, specialized team that's going to safely transport this child to the, um, to the PQ. The PQ then obviously offers the uh, organ support that, the, that an acutely ill child needs. Um, but more importantly, I think the PQ team then um, acts as the facilitator, the coordinator of any specialized treatment and, and maintains an overall uh, focus on the child's um, uh, health and, and or not just one organ. Uh, again, leaving the specialists focus on their part of the treatment. And when we all work together, I think it works beautifully because we are able to um, pick out these um, rare um, or, or atypical presentations. We collect data. We're able to um, uh, report these um, and, and have research that's going to uh, uh, affect um, further treatment of these patients and, and the future um, of how these patients present. Um, so this is a, a, a study from uh, a, a North American, uh, 42 hospitals in North America, where they, they did some epidemiologic studies. And when looking at, at myocarditis, um, Unfortunately, it's heterogeneous clinical presentation. There's no unique phenotype. Um, an accurate diagnosis is quite difficult. So all we could do really is have this early clinical suspicion um, and then aggressively um, stabilize and manage as soon as we um, when as soon as that comes to mind. Um, and hence the alerts um, become very, very important in terms of raising awareness and then reporting in the sense of getting uh, viruses typed to understand why certain patients develop fulminant disease versus others um, mild disease. 
The other thing that can raise the suspicion and raise the index of suspicion locally when the patient first uh, presents is the age of the patient. So we know there are peaks in terms of age presentation. So the new nays would present, um, and that's probably the highest peak. Um, another peak in early childhood, and then a much later peak in the late teens. These patients, um, trajectory is going to be ICU. You've got a higher than um, two thirds of them um, would, would end up be, being in intensive care. Um, a good proportion of over 40% are going to need mechanical ventilation or mechanical support. And in terms of um, uh, mechanical circulatory support, we have uh, a good number of them um, uh, requiring ECMO rather than um, Um, ECMO, and I think ECMO rather than VADS in terms of mechanical security support, and that's uh, probably because of the availability in ICUs. This is a single center study, um, and it's a retrospective review of their patients. They had uh, 60 patients, and they're looking at the most severe patients that ended up in ICU. Um, and if we look at this um, presentation, the um, fulminant uh, acute myocarditis younger age group as opposed to the um, uh, older group which had uh, acute myocarditis but not as fulminant. And then if we look at the predominant complaint at presentation, um, GI um, complaints and abnormal x-rays, and I think lots of the time the GI is, is missed as a sign of poor cardiac output and is, um, is uh, missed as a, a gastroenteritis. And I think the more we start uh, putting the signs and symptoms of these patients together and if a patient is uh, tachycardic with, with weak pulses um, and GI symptoms, we should start to look at these more of a um, sign of uh, low cardiac output rather than uh, a, a GI that's upset. Looking at ECGs, even though both the uh, acute fulminant and the acute myocarditis, um, a similar percentage had abnormal ECGs, a higher percentage of arrhythmias in the fulminant uh, myocarditis. And when we see the ECGs, and I'll show, I'll show you a couple later, um, a, uh, a salient mark of a myocarditis is tachycardia and low amplitude. But once um, arrhythmias become part of the presentation of um, myocarditis, that's a poor prognostic sign because it does not uh, indicate an inflamed myocardium, it indicates a failing myocardium. I'll share a recent case that we um, had uh, several weeks ago. Um, this is a child that interestingly was still in hospital antenatally. Then there was um, maternal raised inflammatory markers, but mom refused antibiotics. Um, and then by day two, the baby had become lethargic and was treated as suspected sepsis as, as we would. Um, by day three, there was increased work of breathing, developed some abnormal movement on day four, and by day six, there was worsening of the uh, respiratory um, symptoms with tachycardia. We got the phone call, um, and the um, salient thing on the um, on the trans on the uh, retrieval form that I am highlighting here is the child looked unwell, and that's really very important. There's some gut feeling that. So things are not are not right in these patients. They've been screened for antibiotics. They um, they should be responding, but for some reason they still look unwell. They're tachycardic. Their perfusion is just off. And then when you tease through the um, presentation of these children, they're tachycardic and it's baseline tachycardia that has reached up to 190. Um, and at this stage, there was no liver when they presented. But actually, when we uh, followed up with them, this is the kind of X-ray that this child would have. So a um, a relative uh, a relatively uh, enlarged uh, uh, cardiac uh, uh, shadow and very plethoric lung fields. I don't know if it's um, showing through, but there's there you can just about start to see some fluid in the fissure as well in this X-ray. And when we look at the um, um, signs, you can see the um, the baseline tachycardia, and more importantly, you can see the response to fluid. Um, in a septic child, the response to fluid would be yes, a an improvement in the tachycardia. So the we would want to see a desirable effect would be a drop in heart rate, but in this case, you can see that the patient's um, blood pressure drops and the pulse pressure narrows. 
that's a sign that the heart is stretched at the end of the starling uh, curve, really, and fluid is not increasing uh, cardiac output. It's actually going to push the child um, over the edge. So these are the subtle signs that we would want to be teasing out with the local team when we go through this. So we've identified that the child is shocked because they're tachycardic, their pulses are weak, and there is no magic bullet. They don't come with a, um, with a sign that says, I have myocarditis. And we would generally go through with you the um, guideline that we share repeatedly when we come out to the DGH, which is the neonatal collapse. And we'll go through, if we identified shock, let's evaluate, let's see what the response to fluid is. Uh, is it refractory shock? And when is the time to start um, giving um, some inotropes? And we're going to discuss ventilation in a second. The other thing that we probably should analyze is the cardiac response. And I talked about the cardiac response to uh, fluid, looking at what the heart rate does, looking at what the blood pressure does, and in terms of does the blood pressure maintain itself or improve, and looking at the um, pulse pressure as well. But also then go back, uh, coming back together and examining the patients. Let's listen to the heart rate. Can we hear? I know it's old school, but I still like old school. Can we listen to the heart rate? Can we hear a gallop? Um, let's put our, our, our hands back on the abdomen. What's happening? Can we feel a liver? Um, and uh, when we talk about the rhythm, I talked about the, um, the uh, ECG. Is it just tachycardia? What's happening to the QRS um, complex in terms of intensity? And is it um, regularly is it a sinus tachycardia or do we have uh, arrhythmia uh, in there as well? Feeling for the pulses, um, again, this is a neonate, is this a neonatal collapse, can I feel a femoral pulse? And the caveat with that is in a shocked baby, you might not feel a femoral pulse, and that's not necessarily a co-occultation, but that might just be a, a, a poor, um, a poorly perfused uh, patient or, or, or the cardiac output giving way. So in our patient, this is the kind of x-ray that was the ECG that we first saw. And most of us have only seen these kinds of, of ECGs in, in adults that have uh, myocardial infarctions with um, uh, elaborate um, depression or, uh, or um, uh, ST depression across all leads. Um, but actually, when, when the myocardium is inf inflamed, um, this is the strain pattern that you're going to get. And once the, the um, uh, conduction bundle is affected, the arrhythmia um, can, can ensue. And when the, when the ventricle starts to fail, uh, all kinds of arrhythmias can, can, be, um, uh, can be seen. Um, apologies about this. This should read 2,863. Troponin uh, was taken as soon as that ECG was seen. Um, and troponin is obviously a marker of uh, myocardial damage. Interestingly, when they followed um, troponin in uh, fulminant myocarditis, um, that is a sign of fulminant myocarditis um, and not a prognostic sign. So uh, a troponin in, in, in bad myocarditis, in, in a fulminant myocarditis, will be up in the thousands, so about 100 times more than normal plus um, uh, and over that. Uh, but again, it's a sign of... Uh, a fulminant inflammation and not a sign of, of, of prognosis. And that's good to know and, and, and kind of reassuring, I would think. Um, and this is what I was talking about when I talked about the um, an, an ECG that we'd look for. The uh, more um, uh, classical sign of myocarditis will be the tachycardia uh, with uh, low uh, voltage QRS complexes. But as um, the inflammation um, severity increases, all kinds of arrhythmias, and once um, there is a ventricular uh, or wide complex tachycardias, that's a very uh, poor prognosticating fact, uh, sign, and, and that means you, you probably should be looking at moving this child or the child should all be, dis be discussed for uh, mechanical surfaces support at that, at that stage. So um, discussions with the local team before the patient is retrieved and brought to the uh, PICU, how can we reduce oxygen demand? Um, simple things um, uh, are, are first addressed. Temperature, can I just decrease the temperature? Um, if the child is irritable, I, I would be cautious about, say, give sedation, but rather um, can, can they be held in mom's arms or dad in, in the parent's arms and, and, and calm down? Um, and lots of cautious about sedation before, uh, before supporting um, the cardiac function. Managing fluids, um, we've seen the response uh, of the heart and the blood pressure to fluids, so we would be uh, advising restriction to fluid at this stage and um, diuretics.
in terms of respiratory support, um, non-invasive ventilation, if the child uh, tolerates it, um, is probably more uh, uh, what we would advise rather than intubation if there is um, room for that. Um, and I'll discuss this point in a, in a minute. And, the, and I think that one of the things that we found very tricky when we discussed respiratory support with the DGH is that the local pediatrician ends up becoming the, the middleman. And I think it's so much easier to just talk directly with the anesthetist um, when we discuss um, uh, the, the possibility of intubating a very sick child with, with uh, significant uh, hemodynamic compromise. And I'll get to that in a second. The other thing that is um, uh, probably very important is access. And rather than um, uh, wait for central access or um, look for sedating a child to put central access, I think we're very lucky now that we that we have um, peripheral inotropes um, that are embraced by everyone. And I think this is definitely a child that we would start peripheral inotropes. Um, Sandra, my colleague from um, PICU, will be talking about um, inotropic support and so on. So I'll, I won't dwell too much into that. But all I'll say at this stage is that we would probably be suggesting um, peripheral uh, epinephrine at this stage uh, plus melgrinone to support the left ventricle. In terms of sampling and the timing for central access, I think that all has to be discussed as a case by case. Uh, where are we in terms of supporting the child? But getting the peripheral inotropes forced and the melrinone really just buys you time. Um, and if the child tolerates the non-invasive ventilation, the best thing we can do is anticipate risk because if we're going to give any kind of anesthetic agent or sedative, we're going to abolish the intrinsic sympathetic drive that's probably keeping this child alive at this stage. And, and, and it's at the end of that extreme. Um, stretch of the myocardium and everything that's just keeping things going. So if you give any kind of um, uh, sedative or anesthetic uh, induction, um, you basically abolish that and the risk of an impending loss of output is um, is very high. So we completely understand it when there's lots of resistance from the local anesthetic team not to intubate this child. Um, once there's positive pressure ventilation, even if it's bag mask ventilation, there is um, uh, an impedance to venous return, um, and that that can also uh, compromise a child. Um, if we don't anticipate and prevent uh, an arrest, if these children go into um, a loss of output, it becomes very difficult to achieve ROSC um, uh, at this stage. What can we do? We can mitigate this happening. We can plan, do a timeout, decide whether it's advisable to be doing this in a DGH in a case like this. Shall we wait until the patient is in PICU with the specialist team around? If we all agree that it's probably um, that the child will not uh, tolerate a transfer um, from the DGH to the PICU, then we're talking about the expert team. Um, this is not um, a patient that you're going to let one of your junior uh, doctors um, uh, train on it. This is probably one that, that you're going to want the most experienced and most and, and most experienced. And sometimes the most experienced is not the most senior, the, the person that can put the tube in. Uh, but I think the team needs to be there and have that discussion locally. Um, if we go back to our patient, this patient came in to uh, pick you at the Avelina at about 7 p.m. And you can see the persistent tachycardia. Um, and this child stayed on non-invasive ventilation overnight. Um, what we saw overnight was, other than the persistent tachycardia, the progressive narrowing of the blood pressure and the rising lactate. Um, we prepared um, our ECMO team and um, intubated him when everybody was in the building at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and there was discussion overnight for an emergency intervention. But I think this is, probably the safest thing to do. And if we felt that the patient wasn't going to last overnight, then we would have had everybody come in earlier on in the night. This is not a patient that you're going to be intubating um, after midnight, not in a PQ and definitely not in a, in a DGH if you, if, if you uh, to do. Um, 
So um, I'll leave you with this. If there is a high index of suspicion um, and uh, if there is a history of a flu-like illness with persistent tachycardia, signs of heart failure, and sometimes we have to go and, and, and really look at that and, and, and dig for the signs of heart failure, whether it's the cardiomegalitic tachycardia, um, the persistent tachycardia, or the, or the, refu or the um, response to our fluid challenges when we try to resuscitate for shock. Then we will consider these as myocarditis and, until proven otherwise, and we'll be discussing with our cardiology colleagues, um, and we'll send off the STRS team to help support, um, facilitate the bed, and retrieve them back to PICU. And I'll hand over now to uh, my colleague, um, Alessandra, to talk more about um, the cardiology part of it. Um. I'm going to again to go through the cardiac aspect of the myocarditis in children. So uh, as already uh, said, uh, the myocarditis is an inflammatory process of the cardiac myocyte and uh, it can result in myocardial edema and uh, in the worst case uh, in uh, necrosis and scars. The diagnosis and the um, uh, appropriate management of uh, myocarditis is very important because it's still one of the major causes of uh, sudden death in children and uh, athletes. There are a couple of studies uh, from uh, USA which shows that the myocarditis is still responsible for 9 to 12 percent of the sudden death uh, in uh, children. So it's important detect myocarditis, so which are the symptoms that should raise suspicion of myocarditis. Very often babies present with uh, respiratory symptoms uh, like tachypnea, but even in older kids we can see uh, breathless on exertion or even at rest. Gastrointestinal symptoms are, uh, can be present as well, abdominal pain, vomit, uh, they might have chest pain, palpitation and uh, uh, symptoms. Copy. Um, one of the uh, first investigation that we do is uh, the 12 lead ACG, which might be uh, might show some a specific abnormality, uh, but in some case can be uh, really uh, useful. A normal 12 lead ACG uh, doesn't allow to rule out uh, uh, myocarditis. Uh, so one of the most common findings is the low QRS voltages. Uh, we can have some abnormality of the regularization, in particular ST uh, depression and prolongation of the QT interval, as well as T way inversion. Uh, but uh, importantly, what we can have uh, is a degree of uh, atrioventricular conduction delay that we can go from mild degree to a complete atrioventricular block. And I would recommend in case you see some degree of atrioventricular conduction that is unknown uh, to think about uh, myocarditis. This is an example of complete AV block. You can see that the P way are completely dissociated uh, uh, from the uh, Q uh, from the QRS. Even if you have an intermittent complete heavy block, uh, think about uh, uh, myocarditis. The echocardiogram uh, definitely is really helpful because uh, uh, it can show that in the majority of cases left ventricular dilatation with a reduced systolic function, although in case of fulminant myocarditis, the left ventricular dimension can be normal, but the uh, systolic function is reduced. Sometimes we can have hypertrophy, very often it's the septum that is hypertrophied, uh, but not because of uh, the uh, uh, hypertrophy of the muscle, because of uh, the edema. And in some cases we can have a restricted pattern. Um, we can also observe some um, segmental wall motion abnormalities and very often there is a pericardial effusion, so we are talking about uh, perimyocarditis. How can we assess uh, the dilatation and reduce systolic function on echocardiogram? Uh, 
So one, uh, uh, it would be uh, helpful to have a left ventricle volume, but of course, if we use echocardiography, the two dimensional exam, we have the to measure the diameter. How we can do that is quite simple. It's one of the oldest echocardiography mode, which is called M mode. So what we can do, we can put a cursor along the long parasternal axis view, and we cut the uh, anterior wall of the right right ventricle, the cavity, the septum, the cavity of the left ventricle and the posterior wall. Uh, imagine to flip the plane and you can see all these different structure, how they behave over time. So you can measure at the beginning of the QRS the end diastolic diameter of the left ventricle and you can measure as well the end systolic diameter. Uh, again, in pediatrics, the absolute numbers doesn't mean much, so you should uh, put this number in relation to the body surface to get what we uh, call a Z-score, and a Z-score that is above plus two is indicative of left ventricular dilatation. In terms of functional assessment, what is really useful is the shortening fraction that we can very easily measure from the MO that I just showed you. There is a formula to do that, and the normal value of shortening fraction is between 35 and 45%. Another important parameter that we measure is the ejection fraction width is measured um, using the uh, end diastolic and the end systolic volume of the left ventricle. Again, how we can estimate the volume, there are some methods like the Simpson method that we show you or next and the 3D. But importantly, the ejection fraction is normal above 55 percent. We talk about mild depressed systolic function when the um, uh, EF is between 45 and 54 percent, moderately depressed function when the EF is between 30 and 44 and severe depressed when it is below 30 percent. Again, we can um, estimate the volume even if we are using a two-dimensional exam using this method, which is called a Simpson biplane method. We use the four-chamber view at the end of the diastole and at the end of the systole. We trace the endocardial profile and the machine divides these corners in little rectangular and each rectangular corresponds to a, an elliptical disk. So the sum of all these disks, the volume of these disks give us a, a estimation of the end diastolic and end systolic volume so we can get the ejection fraction. Another tool that we use on echocardiography to estimate the function, uh, I'm telling this because sometimes you might read an echocardiography report and we say GLS is the global longitudinal strain. So what does it mean? Is the longitudinal deformation of the myocardium. Uh, so the myocardium in systole is shortening, so we will have a negative value. Um, but the global longitudinal strain is very important because it allows us to examine the different segment of the myocardium. Uh, in fact, you can see here from the four chamber view, we can analyze the septum and the lateral wall. In by uh, chamber view, we can see the posterior inferior wall and the anterior wall, as well as uh, again in the three chamber view. And imagine we can divide uh, all these uh, in 17 segments in total, the basal, the medial and the apical and uh, try to uh, plot all these segments here. Again, you can see the septal basal segment, the, the uh, medium septal segment, the apical, the anterior, the lateral and the inferior. And uh, uh, it's very important that uh, each one, each segment uh, has uh, a shortening, which is, is basically bright red, means that uh, it's shortening appropriately. If it is light red or even pink, it means that the degree of shortening is pathological and if it's blue it means that the movement is paradoxical because this segment is ischemic. So 10 years ago, probably uh, um, the gold standard for the diagnosis of the uh, endomyocarditis of myocarditis was considered to be the endomyocardial biopsy, but uh, it's not uh, anymore like this because of the spread of uh, less other less invasive diagnostic technique. Uh, 
uh, with the endomyocardial biopsy, we take a sample from the right side of the septum. We can analyze this uh, sample and detect the inflammatory cells uh, in the myocardium, but also using the uh, polymerized change reaction, we can detect the uh, viruses. Um, nonetheless, there are some uh, downside because uh, very often the uh, early um, the inflammation starts from the lateral wall of uh, the left ventricle, which is not what is uh, sampled uh, routinely. Although we can take also other sample samples, but this will increase the uh, complication. Another limitation is that the error sample itself and uh, also the difficulty in determining interpretation of the, sam the sample even uh, between experts uh, and uh, the risk uh, related to the invasive nature of the procedure such as arrhythmia, bleeding and tamponade. So at the moment the endomyocardial biopsy is recommended when the, the myocarditis doesn't respond to, to the uh, treatment in one to two weeks time. So nowadays, the gold standard for the diagnosis uh, for the myocarditis uh, is uh, considered the cardiac MRI. Definitely, uh, echocardiography is helpful, but with the cardiac MRI, we can assess the left ventricle volume in three dimension. We can assess, we can have a precise assessment of the ejection fraction, and we can measure the wall uh, thickness. But more importantly, we can see edema, fibrosis, and hyperemia. And how can we? Uh, during the uh, cardiac MRI, we give uh, contrast, we give gadol gadolinium, and uh, if we see that there are areas that uh, uh, get bright early, we define this area as the area of early gadolinium enhancement, and this area are indicative of inflammation and uh, hyperemia. So it's easy to understand that if you have an inflamed area, this area is more vascularized, so it will bring the gadolinium first. Uh, opposite, uh, when at some point uh, uh, the um, uh, gadolinium is washed out, but if you have area where the gadolinium is persisting, so ha you have late gadolinium enhancement, this is indicative of a scar and fibrosis, and again, uh, it's easy to understand this area are not vascularized as before, so the, um, the washout of the gadolinium is definitely more difficult. And then again, we can use the T1 weighted and T2 weighted sequence. So what does it mean? Just to make it easy, the uh, T2 weighted uh, sequences uh, uh, enhance the water signal and suppress the fatty tissue signal. So in this, uh, using this sequence, we can identify uh, interstitial edema. All of this to say that we have nowadays the Lake Lewis criteria to diagnose myocarditis with cardiac MRI. Uh, and we, if we have at least two criteria, which include a regional or global uh, myocardial signal intensity increase in T2, so edema, or uh, an increased global myocardial early enhancement, so hyperemia, or uh, a late gadolinium enhancement, so fibrosis. If if you have uh, two of these criteria, the diagnosis of myocarditis is basically done. Well, I'm finishing my talk, just bringing you some example. This is a patient with myocarditis that has been admitted uh, recently in uh, our uh, um, uh, pediatric intensive care. You can see a four chamber view here. You can see how visually the left ventricle is dilated. Uh, and you can see how the uh, lateral wall is, is not uh, doing too much, why the uh, septum is definitely hypokinetic, but is moving better than what the lateral wall is. On color Doppler, you can see uh, the uh, mitral regurgitation that often is present in myocarditis as effect of the uh, left ventricle. Again, this is a, a bi-chamber view where you see, again, the hypokinesia of the uh, posterior inferior uh, wall. Uh, 
and this is again the long axis view where can, you can appreciate the septum and uh, the uh, postural wall and again the septum which is hyperkinetic but move much much better than the postural wall and you can also appreciate visually that the left atrium appears to be dilated Again, on M mode, uh, as I showed you before, you can measure the diameter, and definitely this diameter was above the plus two of the Z score, but you can also measure what is the aorta, LA aorta ratio that normally should be below 1.2, in this case was largely above, giving us the impression that the left atrium is definitely dilated. This is a short axis view of the same ventricle. Again, you can appreciate the dyskinesia of the postural lateral wall. And this is the use of the 3D echocardiography to estimate the global ejection fraction, uh, uh, which was definitely impaired 34.6%. And to end again, you can see the application of the longitudinal strain. So the global longitudinal strain is minus 10, which is definitely pathological because it should be uh, above minus 17. But you can also here on the eyeballing, um, you can see uh, that there is only one segment that is bright red, so it's moving appropriately with a normal strain, which is the basal septum. All the rest is just light red, so it's hyperkinetic, and this part is pink, so it's, it's definitely uh, very depressed. But you can see that the part that are moving less are those that visually look moving less, so the lateral and inferior uh, wall on the basal, medium and apical level finished now. Thank you so much. Now I think it's the turn of uh, Sandra. Okay, so I'm going to talk about my, uh, viral myocarditis and the acute management in intensive care. So I will try to be very brief and I know that is quite a complex topic, um, but I tried to give some highlights and some of them they have already uh, been mentioned by the previous... Um, wait a second. Ah yeah, perfect. So what we have learned so far, so we know that these patients, they are extremely sick, they are fragile, they have very poor reserve, as Manal has explained very well. We know that they have a bimodal age presentation um, where the little ones, uh, they are at risk, and then we have a second wave when they are at teenagers. And, and we know that um, acute myocardial injury in those group uh, of patients is more rightly related to viral infection as a difference of adults that uh, are most likely to be related to myocardial infarction. Uh, but of course, we need to keep ourselves open with a good di a differential diagnosis. This continue being, being crucial through all the admission in, in PICU. So are we facing other reasons uh, like coronary abnormalities, ALKAPA, like the most common in the small children? Is a, is a cardiomyopathy with acute and chronic um, decompensation. Is a leventrical dysfunction related to sepsis, septic shock. Is a primary arrhythmia with a prolonged SVT. And of course, we need to, to add into this mix the, the COVID with the COVID, uh, the post-COVID vaccine myocarditis and also the PIMS-DS. So when these patients, they arrive to intensive care, uh, some of them, they are newly diagnosed, so we have very little information apart from the clinical history. So we are just working with a suspected or possible clinical diagnosis of myocarditis. Alessandra has mentioned biopsy and, and uh, MRI. That can be done in a second stage when, when the, the patient has uh, is beyond the acute phase. But until, until that stage, we need to go with what we suspect. And, and also, uh, to make it a bit more complex, the type of presentations, they are not as simple. So it's very easy to recognize the acute myocarditis, what is called the fulminal um, myocarditis, a hyperacute presentation. However, we know that uh, these patients, depending on the clearance of the viremia and the timing of the presentation, they have subacute forms or even chronic forms. So the management of them is going to change in these three group of patients. And I think the challenge and the magic of these patients is trying to understand what we can do for each of them, um, how much aggressive we can be, how much we can be uh, conservative with them. I think that's the, the challenge of these patients. <clears throat> 
And I'm going to present a couple of cases as, as with that we have a bit more discussion. So um, the first case that we have last March is a 15 year old young lady with seven days of sore throat and fever who presented at the local hospital pale tachycardic hypotensive. Of course, this could be a sepsis. Yeah. Uh, she had some fluid resuscitation and, and she was lucky enough to, to be assessed by the adult team and, and they did a fast echo protocol that showed poor left, ventricle, <coughs> poor left ventricle function and a potential left ventricle thrombosis. Troponins at the local hospital, they were slightly raised, 130 and the BMP was uh, high. Because the age and the weight, um, she was also lucky and assessed by the ECMO adult retrieval team that uh, with the retrieval team that in this, in this case was Panda, they decided that the child was stable enough to be transferred in sc scoop and run without being ventilated towards um, our, adult, our uh, ICU. She was commenced on peripheral melrinone and also on adrenaline. She was also lucky um, because uh, the fast uh, virus uh, uh, nasal swab detected immediately uh, influenza B. So by the time that the patient was in intensive care, we had a lot of information already from her. So that it, it was very, very helpful. Um, and as you can see, she came at three o'clock in the morning, which is the worst time to be admitted in the intensive care. The cortisol level of all the medical and nursing staff is in the lower level possible. Um, but but I think that um, yeah, it was it, it was challenging. But um, but the team managed uh, quite well, and I have to say thank you to them for that. So she was admitted. Um, yeah, she was admitted with a lactate of twelve. She was talking, she was a bit anxious, she was tachycardic. And, the, and at that time already, the, the medical team uh, that was working that night already had activated the ECMO team. But of course, what it happens in the middle of the night that the ECMO team is not available immediately. So they, it needs a bit of time. So that's why anticipation and preparation is crucial on these patients. And everything was ready by six o'clock in the morning. So by these three hours, the lactate went up to 13.6. The child was still the, um, this young lady was still talking, was a bit anxious. I think that the medical team and the nursing team did a very good job just trying to keep her quiet, uh, uh, take out all the stress, make her comfort. And then at six o'clock when the, uh, the whole team was around, so the, um, the surgical team uh, prepared the field and immediately uh, she was intubated and when the procedure was uh, done and stable the child was cannulated for ECMO and why it was done that because as you can see the troponins were in the local hospital 130 but at the time of admission the troponins were already 8,000 so it was clearly a fulminant myocarditis and there was no time to waste so that it would need to be done with a, a good MDT approach and a, and a ECMO backup always always available. So slowly the lactate clear. She was five days on ECMO. She was uh, a, she was wean off uh, stable. She developed renal failure and um, she had CBBH for a couple of weeks. And currently is at home neurologically intact and with normal renal function. So I think that that is is a good example. Of course, out of many examples that they don't go well, but uh, this this is a good example to to see how things can go well from the very beginning, from the local hospital, the retrieval team, and the admission in intensive care. We have a second case. Um, she is uh, admitted currently in the unit. She's 14 year old, um, with uh, that presented at the local hospital with seven days of jaundice and dyspnea. She refers three weeks early, having had some vomits. Um, she was tachycardi and with mildly deranged liver uh, dysfunction at the local hospital. On admission, she had cardiomegaly. So. We don't know yet what is the final diagnosis of this patient, but it's likely that this is a post-viral myocarditis. So this patient probably having the same uh, condition is in the other side of the spectrum. So during these three weeks, she has developed enough uh, compensatory mechanisms to be able to be in the unit um, uh, talking, breathing by herself, just with a bit of oxygen and with a good response to the IV uh, melrenone. And as you can see, it's a completely different picture. The lactate on admission was 1.8. The troponins were low and the VAP was slightly rise. So, so there are two ends of the spectrum of a, of a similar, of the same condition. And that, that is the, the importance to make um, a cautious and judicious um, approach.
So with that, what we learned, so assessment, anticipation and preparation before the arri arrival is important. Assessment at admission um, for signs of cardiogenic shock. So how is the color of the lips? How is peripherally the, um, the temperature? Does she have signs of pulmonary edema? facial edema is there any reference of a sudden increase on the weight if possible are the uh, are the nappies wet is she maintaining some um they, they maintain a spontaneous urine anything that can tell us what is how is the patient progressing uh, since uh, being seen in e &E? and of course always a broader team discussion uh it's not a single person discussion uh because at the the timing of any intervention is crucial exposure of sedatives can uh, cause and uh, um, acute deterioration. So the timing for intubation, central access and arterial line, it need to be discussed with broader team and try and always uh, to do it as a, with an ECMO backup. So very briefly, I try to be, to be quick. Um, what are the recommendations uh, for management in PICO? I think that Manal has already mentioned most of them, so I, I try not to, to, to mention them. So the most important thing is they are going to need advanced PICO monitoring if possible, including um, a good access. But of course, if you have a peripheral line that is bleeding back, use it. Um, use it until uh, the patient is a bit more stable. So get the lactates and the um, gases from there just to, to give the patient some time to, to be comfortable and, and settle on the new environment. And it's very stressful for, for the children. Um, try to be very vigilant with uh, end organ dysfunction. With the renal function, not only the urine that uh, you are uh, observing, also the, the creatinine and the urea. Liver function as a marker of, um, of liver distension and, and cardiac failure. If the patient has uh, lower uh, brain oxygenation, it's going to become agitated, it's going to be delirious. So this is the worst scenario that you can be on these patients. And also look for abdominal pain, not only for liver capsule dis uh, distension, also for um, abdominal venous congestion. Um, ECG is essential uh, because the risk of arrhythmias, especially in fulminant myocarditis, is directly related with poor early outcome. Um, uh, and of course, the next step is going to be echo, um, echo monitoring. Any change it needs to be um, also uh, checked with uh, echo. Uh, it's not going to change dramatically the function from in 12 hours echo, but we know that uh, these patients, they have a high risk of developing left ventricle thrombi. Um, and for that, they need to be anticoagulated and on, or on aspirin if the ejection fraction is um, severely depressed, less than 30, 35%. Um, then how we can follow up uh, the treatment, how we can know if the treatment that we are doing is effective or not. So we have two biomarkers, the troponin and the BNP or, or pro-BNP. Of course, all of them, they need to be taken in consideration with the clinical um, assessment, the clinician assessment, the context and and also it needs to be taken into consideration depending on the diagnosis of the patient. So uh, troponin itself is not going to diagnose, as, as we have seen in the previous talks, it's not going to diagnose um, myocarditis. It's going to help and support the diagnosis with additional clinical features um, and has not been correlated with cardiac dysfunction in children or arrhythmias because they are unspecifically high when there is any um, um, left ventricle or, or heart um, dysfunction. But what specifically for myocarditis, a higher level of troponin is associated with the use of ECMO and mortality. So the first case that I presented with uh, troponins in less than four, six hours of 8,000. So that is an indication of mortality. So, so it's those patients who need to be very aggressive on treating them. And the VNP, pro-VNP, nothing specific for myocarditis. Um, it's more specific as, a, as an indication of cardiac failure. And not only the value itself, it's just a trend. Uh, and, and the problem of the VNP is uh, uh, we don't have the VNP available every single day. We, we overlap running a couple of times per week. So, so it, it doesn't give an immediate answer like the troponin would do, that you can have it in a couple of hours. It takes a bit of time. So that's why it's used as a trend uh, to monitor cardiac dysfunction, how the signs of heart failure are doing, and, and the, the anticipation of potential cardiac arrest or the need of mechanical support. 
and and what else we can do for these patients i think that most of them has been already covered um our main goal is to make sure that the patient is free of stress that is comfortable and that give us time to decide to decide where we are going the travel the, the direction of travel of treatment for this patient don't forget the oxygen uh, it's very annoying to have a nasal cannula, but we need to improve as much as possible the, the oxygen uh, delivery on these patients on the myocardium. Um, what else we can do? So promoting negative balance is not going to change the outcome if they are on TDS or BD or QDS for but definitely they are going to um, improve the symptomatology of the patients and the signs of pulmonary edema. Um, so that's why it's, it's crucial to, to have a good um, a fluid restriction and promoting the, the negative balance of these patients. If possible, we should weigh them every day. Um, and what we do with the anotropical support? Well, here um, there are recommendations. Um, it depends very, mal, very much on local, um, local guidance, on, on personal experience. Our recommendation would be uh, melanin and adrenaline as a first instance. Um, dobutamine and dopamine has been traditionally used, but it has some drawbacks on these medications. So we know that melanin is after low reductor is going to reduce the SBRs and the PBRs and it's going to relax the heart. So as a fair instance, it's the first uh, IV medication in, uh, in acutely deteriorating patients if the blood pressure is stable, uh, because that would be the, the limiting factor. Um, adrenaline would be our second choice. Um, lower doses of adrenaline, they are uh, prefer they have more affinity for B1 and myocardial receptors, so they are chronotropic positive and anotropic positive. Higher doses of that, beyond 0.1, classically used more in sepsis, they are not so beneficial for the heart because they can increase the afterload because they um, stimulate the alpha-1 peripheral receptors. So, so we would... Uh, we would recommend don't go beyond 0.1. But of course, at the end of the day, it's more or less what the patient is going to need. If you need to go more than 0.1, then you need to escalate towards uh, ECMO, perhaps, or, or have further discussion with the extended team. Um, noradrenaline and vasopressin, they are medications that um, should be avoided if possible because they are purely after low reductor. So they are not going to help the uh, the left ventricle function. They are going to primarily increase the SBRs. So perhaps you will see a better blood pressure in the number, uh, but it doesn't correlate with a better function of the heart. Um, so that's why they are need to be used very, very cautiously, and, and I haven't included them in this slide. Dobutamine and dopamine has been classically used in, um, in cardiac failure. The vitamin uh, historically has been used peripherally because uh, stimulation of the V2 peripheral receptors reduces the SBR and can be used peripherally. However, there is a drawback on using the vitamin that is um, they are very is, is an agent very tachycardic. Um, so these patients they can become extremely tachycardic and increasing the stress of the myocardium. So that's why there is not a probably our first choice. Um, but obviously in the neonatal areas, um, they are, the dobutamine and dopamine, that combination is much more used. And dopamine, yes, um, uh, the, 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 well, the reason perhaps why we have been using more adrenaline and is more extended in cardiac intensive care is because the oxygen consumption with dopamine is higher at the level of the myocardium than with adrenaline. So that's why traditionally these patients post cardiac surgery, for example, they are uh, treated with melanin and adrenaline. So I'm hoping that this slide answers some of the questions of, of the chat. Then uh, while the, the, this question happened on the chat, I just add uh, our guideline. This is only a guideline. Um, I always refer to the local guidelines that all of you have in the local in, in your in your hospitals. So for standard concentrations for adrenaline peripherally or centrally. Um, and as you can see, the maximum dose even for peripheral is 0.5. I don't think that we have reached that dose, honestly. We normally stop around 0 0.05. Higher than that, then we need to consider a central access because, uh, as you know, the extravasations, they can be quite uh, severe. And then milrenone that can be given peripherally. And I just add this just as an additional information. <laughs> 
And then arrhythmias. Um, fulminant uh, myocarditis, they are a high risk of arrhythmias. I have been a bit cheeky. This is not a myocarditis. This is another cardiomyopathy patient that we were unsure at the beginning the diagnosis. Now it seems more like it's a channelopathy presenting with a BF arrest at the local hospital. Uh, but at that time, one of the diagnoses that we thought is perhaps is um, uh, perhaps it's a myocarditis. This patient, um, this patient was on ECMO on since admission. Um, and it had five days on ECMO and uh, the rhythm was well controlled. I cannot remember now. I think it was initially with amiodarone and later on with beta blockers. Um, so as I say, be aware, um, the treatment for arrhythmias in these patients continue being the APLS protocol. Um, but of course, beta blockers should be avoided, especially in the acute phase, because as you know, they reduce the heart rate. And then uh, in the acute phase, these patients, they depend very much to sustain the cardiac output with the heart rate. So by reducing the heart rate with beta blockers, we can make this, um, these hemodynamics much worse. So once the patient has a stable and has gone into a sub, uh, into a chronic phase, then is when the, the beta blockers can be considered as a, as a heart rate control. And then ECMO, very, very briefly. Um, there's not that much specifically out there about um, a clear clinical indications when uh, a patient with uh, myocarditis should go uh, to ECMO. But I found this paper and I think it's really nice. So you have the opportunity, just read it. Um, it's the review of the ELSO uh, of 500 uh, fulminant myocarditis and their outcomes uh, with some of the risk factors and especially the timing between the intubation and the cannulation time for ECMO. Um, the overall survival was quite good, 72%, considering that some of these they can um, they can require more prolonged mechanical support or they have the options of transplant. So considering all of that into the equation, the overall survival of these patients is 72%. Uh, survivors, they had higher pre-ECMO pH, meaning that um, the less, let's let's put it in, in kind of less sick they go into ECMO, the more chances to survive, which it seems like a, uh, like a, like a truth, <laughs> like it's, it's obvious. Um, a, and shorter time between the intubation and the cannulation time is associated with better survivals. So as, as you saw in the first case, as soon as we know that this patient is deteriorating and as soon as this patient is intubated, immediately ECMO should be in the picture and uh, do not delay. If there is no cardiac arrest, um, longer intubation to cannulation has been associated with lower survival. And, and one thing that I thought interesting is no difference of survival between the admission time and the intubation time. So, so if the patient is stable, is holding, is compensated, uh, the intubation, there is time to plan the perfect intubation with, um, with ECMO backup. And, and what is the summary that I got from this paper is that uh, perhaps early in the initiation of ECMO is a trick and preventing a cardiac arrest. And uh, the same paper showed the clapham meyer survival rates and the better survival rates is those patients who had uh, establishing ECMO in the uh, first four hours after the intubation time. So I think that it, it, it makes obvious something that we all feel that uh, the longer these patients wait, the, the worse uh, is the end organ damage and also the outcome of them, they will be also worse. And I think that's all. Thank you very much. Lovely, Sandra. That was really interesting and great. Thank science. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so bringing it back a bit more to the enterovirus around which the UK HFA alert is focused. Um, we're getting, we've discussed the supportive care that's super important. Um, and now it's on to actual treatments about the virus. So I think the first thing to say is that, unfortunately, the most commonly used antiviral drug, acyclovir, has no effect in enterovirus. This is because acyclovir is actually a prodrug. It requires phosphorylation by an enzyme thymidine kinase. Enterovirus lacks this enzyme, so acyclovir isn't activated and will not work. Therefore, we need some other options. So what's been used in enterovirus? It's all very limited evidence. A lot of it is kind of at the case report stage, but we're going to briefly go through these 
and have a kind of introduction to them and brief look at the evidence and I will keep it brief. Um, if you've never heard of any of these medications, do not worry, they're not commonly used. We will go through them together. So IVIG, I'm sure all of you have heard about IVIG. It's essentially pooled antibodies and the theory being that antibodies will fight, help fight infection. If you've got pooled antibodies, you're likely to have enterovirus antibodies in there. And also IVIG has shown to slightly modulate the host's immune response or the, the person you're giving to, the patient. It modulates their immune response and so can have beneficial effects. Now, IVIG actually has the most evidence around it of any of the medicines that we're talking about in this talk. However, the evidence is still limited. Um, the most recent meta-analysis is actually from a Taiwanese group in 2019, um, which looked at IVIG use in myocarditis. So this is myocarditis. It's not enterovirus specific. Um, they found 13 studies. These aren't all randomised control trials. They're 13 studies, predominantly uh, retrospective cohort studies, um, and actually included 812 patients. 64% had IVIG and 592 patients did not have IVIG. This is the forest plot um, of their conclusions. As you can see, reading the forest plot down, you've got the 13 studies that they included um, and it's looking at the odds ratio. So in the middle we've got one which is no difference between the IVIG group and the no IVIG group. Um, anything above one suggests a beneficial effect of IVIG. We've got broad confidence intervals um, represented by the lines either side which makes you consider the validity and the efficacy of IVIG. So their initial analysis did suggest that patients who received IVIG had a higher survival rate. The orange diamond at the bottom um, is representative of the overall study conclusion with an odds ratio of about two for survival. However, they then did a trim and fill adjustment and this trim and fill adjustment basically is trying to identify and then correct for publication bias. Um, and following this kind of statistical adjustment, they found that there was no difference in the groups that received IVIG and the groups that did not receive IVIG. So moving on to looking at IVIG in enterovirus infection, not just myocarditis. This is general severe enterovirus infection. Um, and this is a Chinese group who did a retrospective cohort study. 61% of their patients received IVIG. Um, and they were also looking a bit at the timing of IVIG um, and whether early, so given less than three days into the illness, was beneficial compared to later IVIG or after three days of the onset of illness. They concluded that IG IVIG is favourable so severe enterovirus infection concluded IVIG is favourable. They didn't, and it was favourable if given early. They didn't break it down into myocarditis specifically, and they didn't kind of clarify on late IVIG either. So the evidence for IVIG goes both ways, but there are kind of compelling case reports that encourage us to give IVIG and I think there's a general feeling that giving something that we know and have a long historical experience of giving and being relatively safe is kind of beneficial so it's given a lot of the time. The newer antivirals that we're quickly going to touch on firstly Pocapavir. This is a direct antiviral it prevents virus and coating in the cells um, so it can't release viral RNA it can't replicate. It's enterally administered um, and it's kind of been developed for um, an, in phase two clinical trials in adults, more looking at poliovirus. Um, but enterovirus is related, so there is still thought that it could work for enterovirus. There's no um, current licensing in children, but you can get it through compassionate use. Um, and the US company Vira Defense will allow its use um, in paediatrics. It needs to go through Drugs and Therapeutics Committee to get this, which we have done here at the Evelina. Um, and the evidence for it is still limited, but lots of case, but some case reports. 
particularly this neonatal collapse one. This is the Cardiff and Bristol PICU group who um, are the kind of drivers and the leaders behind the UK HSA alert. They've used pocapavir in six of their nine patients in the case series that has triggered the UK HSA alert with relatively good effects. So favipiravir is another antiviral um, that basically prevents um, inhibits RNA polymerase, inducing mutations and loss of the viral fitness to survive. Again, it's centrally administered. Um, it's actually been approved and used in, in Japan, um, predominantly in adults, in influenza for quite a long time now. Um, possible beneficial activity in Ebola, so people thought, could it be effective in enterovirus? Fluoxetine, your over the kind of more common garden, regularly prescribed by GPs for anxiety and depression, is an SSRI. Now, this was screened. Um, basically, teams in the US just screened lots of drugs that are on the already FDA approved license list. And they were just looking whether any had antiviral activity. Bingo, fluoxetine did. Um, it inhibits replication of enterovirus B and D. B being a critical one for our neonatal myocarditis. Um, it's actually got a relatively low barrier to resistance um, and the virus can develop resistance to fluoxetine, which is why it's used in combination with um, another antiviral. So the team at Great Ormond Street have probably got the most experience of using favipiravir um, and fluoxetine and wrote it up in a case report about treating encephalitis in a patient with an underlying immunodeficiency. They at GOSH also have some experience and in our case here that we've discussed in the retrieval um, series have also advised and recommend using nitrosoxanide. Now this has been around for decades. It's actually was initially commercialized and developed as an antiprotozoal agent. You might have heard of it used in cryptosporidium diarrhea. It actually has antiviral activity too. It's not just against protozoa um, and therefore is being used in RNA viruses by the team at GOSH. It's demonstrated to have action against influenza and therefore, why not? Maybe it is effective in um, enterovirus as well. And so for our patient who um, was recently at the Evelina, the neonate with enterovirus myocarditis, who we heard about in the talks earlier from the retrieval team and the cardiology team, he actually was going to have cocapavir, but there were concerns about neck. So we ended up giving um, fluoxetine, nitrosoxanide and favipiravir because these, although given entrally, can be given in smaller volumes. They were stopped after three days because of the neck concerns, um, but he tolerated these medicines well. The other final medicine that I'm going to mention is anakinra. This is more of an immunomodulatory drug. It's an IL-1 receptor antagonist. And this has been used by the Bristol and Cardiff teams in neonatal enterovirus myocarditis because they've actually been seeing quite an HLH um, picture. So a very hyperinflammatory multi-system disease. And they've been using anakinra in six of their patients to um, see if they can modulate that inflammatory response. Again, they've seen some good effects. So. Overall, key take home messages from this enterovirus section, I think, is have a low threshold and high, like high index of suspicion of considering enterovirus infection. It, prevent, it presents in a very non-specific way. They may just have respiratory distress. They may present with a sepsis-like syndrome or shock. Um, they can present with meningitis, particularly in the neonatal period. Thinking about it is critical get an early echo if you can. There are potential treatments for antivirus. Supported treatment with PICU is vital, but there are antivirals out there um, and that we may consider using. So get on the phone, I think, is the main take home from this. Speak to us, speak to cardiology, speak to PICU. We are very happy to have those conversations to help um, decide on the best management plan for the patient. Thank you very much. And that's wonderful.